to The Plain Truth, the show where we go into some of the mysteries, anomalies, and the dirty underbelly of the world around us. I'm your host, Paul. Joining me, joining us this week, we have Joaquin Flores, a geopolitical analyst uh, from the U.S. who's based in Serbia. Um, Joaquin, are you there? Hey, how's it going? Oh, fine. Thanks. Thanks for joining us. And uh, along for the ride is my friend Jerry. Jerry, are you there? Hey, guys. Hey, Jerry. Um, well, Joaquin, uh, I thought it might be a good uh, time now kind of to look back on the last year or so of things heating up between the U.S. or the West, the Anglo-American Empire and Russia. And in a sense, of course, Russia is just the, uh, the vulnerable part, in a sense, of Eurasia. But anyway, um, uh, what are your thoughts looking back on a year? How did it go? Any surprises? Um, this whole mess in the Ukraine. Any any surprises in that? There were a number of surprises. I mean, to to start with, you know, it it it's it's it really challenges us to think about the way we understand uh, how all these kinds of events play out. Because I think that when we look at um, places like in Syria or in Libya, where the fighting never ends, we can see like, okay, right. I mean, the fighting's not going to end. But it's so hard to imagine that on the on the doorstep of Europe. I mean, when we look at the war in, say, like Yugoslavia in the 90s, the civil war, I mean, it heated up. 91, 92 was bad. And then there were pauses. I mean, it pretty much went all the way until the bombing in 99. So that was kind of drawn out. And, it, and even though we like can can understand that on an intellectual level and we know the history I think that there's a, a lot of optimism that might be misplaced and we where we think that things that all the crazy things happened in the past. But clearly crazy things are happening now. And I think that one of the big surprises was that this conflict has gone on now for a year and only seems to be further intensifying. Um, that's a surprise to you? It's not a surprise to me analytically right like on an on an intellectual level it makes perfect sense and it's kind of like what was the safe thing to project it's what we projected it's what we've talked about but mm -hmm. um and emotionally but, but emotionally it's surprising you know that's what it is it, it's like one would imagine that that the, that europe would have you know stepped up its game the u.s would have realized that it's doing something wrong or I mean, it, 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 I mean it, that's, it's purely irrational to think it would stop, but I think that what happens is that we're human beings and we spend most of the time talking to people. We're in a normal society. There's movie theaters and stores and TV, and you just think, oh, okay, it's a problem. It'll get solved, right? But the problem's not getting solved. It's getting bigger. Well, Joaquin, I have a suggestion. You being in uh, Serbia, just play more chess. <laughs> <laughs> get get the human element out. And, <laughs> right. No, I'm just kidding. But, but you know, I mean, analytically right. speaking, right. Uh, I I mean, I when this first started, I was wondering, is this going to start to look like the Yugoslavian wars? Right. Now, of course, they're not the same in all kinds of ways, but you can see how some of the political lineups can kind of go that way. Right. I mean, one of the things that it that is really clear is that for Central Europe and the Balkans that the U.S. plan, and it also applies for Russia, is to do an alliance when they're going to try to overthrow a government, is to make an alliance between the liberals and the nationalists, and then to basically say that the, the government that's in power is too communist or too Russian, which is a strange twist, but you know, in Ukraine, they talk about lustration, that the, that the reason that things are not sufficiently how the Pravi sector wants them is because Poroshenko has too many communists in his government or, you know, and um, and that's an I that is fairly effective meme um, all over Central Europe and in the Balkans. Hmm. Well, I mean, clearly that's part of it. Mm -hmm. um, but I think some of that is just uh, to be expected, right? I mean, I guess um, 
I'll tell you, at the highest level, what surprised me looking back is Russia took, you know, decisive and you could argue aggressive steps with the Crimea. And then, from my point of view, largely went into what you could call a prevent defense or something. Right, right, right. And this was yeah. most interesting. And with that prevent defense, it even did it in a like a much smaller area and with much less involvement than I'd expected. Yeah. Um, what by that, I mean, I, I think they could have just with minimal manpower, you know, done a similar thing in Kharkov or something like that. Or at different yes. times, the rebel area could have been much larger, including, uh, what is it, last August, I guess, when they were uh, crushing the Ukrainian army and then they had the first Minsk. Right. Um, it looks like they could have pretty much easily taken Mariupol and, you know, some more territory. And, um, you know, they didn't. And I, 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 I'd like to know what your thoughts are as to why they didn't. But my speculation would be that they wanted to keep it under total control and make it easier to merge it into a united Ukraine. Right. And right. that therefore, if you had the rebels win, then it would be hard to tell them, sorry, you didn't win. <laughs> <laughs> right, right. Uh, well, what I are guess, your thoughts on that? Well, I think that's a fair point. I, I, I would tend to agree with you. And um, I mean, speaking on surprises, I, I mean, what I was surprised about was that there wasn't something more decisive coming through the winter. And what and what what surprised me, you know, and after looking back, I mean, it, it actually makes more sense. What happened is the, the Russians played it the correct way. But I thought that they would leverage harder on the, you know, gas and not be so forgiving. I guess that's what I'm saying about how long the conflict has drawn out. I thought that through the winter, there'd be something more decisive dealing with with the question of gas. Right. But instead mm -hmm. of, of of playing hardball, they did like a full 180. I think they I think they talked up a good game like they were going to press hard and then rather than doing something that might destabilize Podoshenko and put Kolomoisky in power, um, meaning Pravi Sector and Yadosh and those guys, that they actually really have helping, been helping him to keep some semblance of power through forgiving debt and keeping the power on through the, through the, through the winter. So I guess that's the point on that. Now, with what you're saying, now the size of the territory, and you know, I, I, I was also surprised in the sense that I thought that they might do something more uh, overt, like with um, like how they did Crimea, or before that, really like a frozen conflict with South Ossetia uh, and Abkhazia in Georgia. I thought they might, you know, bring in the military uh, at a certain point um, after the first mints fell apart, say after August or in September, really, when they came to an agreement, and then in the following months when it you know, to make it the agreement stick, I thought they might do something like, you know, peacekeepers or something. Um, what has followed a script is like having it be uh, semi recognized, you know, not recognized. I mean, they're talking two different scripts. It's really similar to how Israel does things, Paul, like when they say, uh, we won't do this. We're not doing this. But if we did do it, it would be justified because of X, Y, and Z. So they're saying they're, they've established their right to act while denying that they're actively involved. So I think it's pretty intelligent. And, uh, you know, looking back, it's the clear way to do it. But yeah, like yourself, I was surprised in the area of the territory. Um, you know, again, uh, my sense of of why they didn't uh, do something more aggressive in, in Kharkov and Odessa, I think it spreads the front out um, too far. I think it would thin out the front. Um, I think that their decisive victories have been because they've concentrated, they've been able to basically have like a little nut, like a little shell in, the, in these little zones that are, that are connected in between Donetsk and Lugansk. And you can see right, in when the big fighting was happening in January and February, that the Debaltstevo protrusion that had been frozen in time um, going back to September um, is actually like a cleavage that cuts through for those who are who are following with their maps of the east of Ukraine, that 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 Debaltstevo protrusion, if you just follow that line all the way through, it would cleave in half uh, the Donetsk uh, Federation of with Lugansk. So 
Yeah, I think they've been able to defend a smaller area, uh, long story short. Mm, and also by not pushing the border to uh, the borders of the oblast, then, you know, if, for example, they were holding the whole oblast, then they couldn't be, they couldn't um, reasonably attack the uh, positions that were shelling them without actually shelling in t outside of the oblast. So they've been able to claim sort of a, not purity of arms, but a moral war. They've been fighting all on their own turf. So when they, when they counterattack the Ukrainian position, it's within Novorossiya. So I think that is also another reason. Well, what about the fact that had they gone in and um, helped all the Russian-speaking areas or the Russian-supporting areas separate, then they essentially lose the rest of, Luke, of uh, Ukraine, right? Um, I, I guess what I mean by that is that if, the, you know, sort of when Russia was gaming this early on, they may have thought that they could sort of flip it back, um, right. flip the whole country back to pro-Russia. Yeah, I think that's still the game. Um, you know, that was the source of the big, you know, argument between uh, Kurginian and Dugin uh, and between uh, some of the militia and uh, people like Strelkov. Um, you know, whether the whether you're shooting for federation, whether you're settling on that, whether that's what you are selling to the people, um, you know, the, the rebels are are not fighting for for federation. Right. But but um, just like in the Spanish Civil War, I mean, there was the Republicans and, you know, they were fighting for a republic. Um, but not necessarily like an anarchist society, but the anarchists and the communists were fighting for something much more radical than the popular front, you know, was organized around. So there's, a, there's parallels with the Spanish Civil War. Um, so I think that you have people like uh, Zakharchenko who represent, you know, a very moderate position. And uh, I think that is where Novorossiya and Russia has landed on him. Um, because he does inspire confidence. He is a military guy, but he also has a civilian role. So he was able to accomplish all of the things that people thought Strelkov might be able to do, but wasn't able to do. And also the line of fighting for uh, federation, you know, Jerry, I think you're, you're spot on with that also, because clearly when you look at the past elections um, leading up in the years, I mean, the only way that you've had any way that they were able to buck the um, orange color revolution 10 years ago uh, was by having those parts of the country that um, later formed around the um, party of regions. And, uh, and party of regions voters and communist voters tend to be in the same parts, um, but party of regions also can appeal to uh, certain types of Ukrainian liberal nationalism, which are also Russia friendly, which is a strange middle point. And Party of Regions really successfully honed in on that because there's a lot of um, people who are not communist, who, who are anti-communist, but also like Russia, or they love Ukraine and, and they see Ukraine and Russia together. So it's, there's a lot of spectrum there. Um, so, but if you pull those regions out that are the party of regions stronghold, um, then, then, then you really basically the Galician influence of the West becomes the culturally and politically predominant factor. So I think that's absolutely correct. And I think that's how Russia has gamed it out. And, and that having been said, a federation would have been the, uh, the best way to go for Russia because, if they could have flipped Ukraine, you know, they could have kept the Federation together. But if Ukraine had have continued down the right sector Nazi path, it would be easier for the uh, the pro-Russian oblast to separate as well, right? That's right. Yes. And, you know, I think they have different contingencies, right? So they have their plan B, plan C, plan, you know, A, B, C, D within those two. And then one, two, three, four, five within the A, B, C, D. So, I mean, they've got, you know, multiple complex contingencies. It can, things can go different ways. You know, what Poland does, what Hungary does, what Poroshenko is told to do. So, but yeah, generally, um, Russia would like to keep Ukraine together because one thing, because further cleavages and, you know, 
look, when your when your mom gets killed from shelling, then you basically swear your life for the rest of my life. Like, I don't care about, you know, nine to five, uh, you know, uh, regular life like your life becomes a mission. There are hundreds of thousands of people now in that country whose life has become a mission. So they're not even interested. You know, justice is on their minds. It's not, you know, bringing peace. I mean, there, there can be no peace without justice for hundreds of thousands of people now. So I think these are the things that the U.S. tries to do. They did this, you know, sectarianism with Sunnis and Shias in the Middle East um, in Iraq. They have successfully have done that. They're doing that to the best they can in Syria. And they're trying to do that in Ukraine. So the tendency to pull things apart is really not in the interest of peace or uh, Russians position either. So so that having been said, do you think that that Ukraine is too far gone to uh, stay federated? Or to to federate or to stay together, I guess, even? Um, I think that there's a a plan that would involve basically needing to have a a type of uh, there's a voice that's missing, which is like a Ukrainian national voice. And I think that um, the project in the in the east of the country had not an inherent flaw, but was inherently directed pro-Russian. But there were like we've talked about Kuchma before and his Ukrainian nationalism um, is 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 dif- is different from, you know, ban- Banderaism, you know, and uh, and even Timoshenko and, and these people um, always favored good economic relationship with with Russia. Um, what we're seeing now is is, um, you know, hey. such so many so much divisiveness and so much killing has happened that, you know, it's like Humpty Dumpty had a great fall and can you put him back together again is really, you know, the question you're asking. Um, And I think the way that they might be able to manage that is they would need a popular revolution uh, in, in Kiev that people who are Ukrainians could own. And maybe the only solution within that is for actually Galicia to have independence, not Novorossiya. So therefore, to be a federal Ukraine, and then Russia could even secure, um, you know, more secure future in Ukraine uh, uh, if if just the Galician part of the West were actually like its own little country like Slovakia or Czech Republic. Hey, Joaquin, when I listen to this, in some senses, I feel like I've been hearing the same story for 15 years. Mm-hmm. Um, I hear what Russia hopes for, right? And it's not a bad hope. They wanted to turn uh, the Ukraine into something like Switzerland between East and West, right? Between the EU and the Eurasian Union and all this kind of stuff. But I don't see how you get there is the problem, right? And like in the mm-hmm. current situation, with, as you said, so many dead I don't see how you put the thing together again. But in addition right. to that, just even setting that aside, what you just said about the nationalism, you had a compromise. You had the um, Kuchma nationalism with the Galician nationalism. Right. right. So the Galician nationalism means all the school books, you know, universities, everything are radically anti Russian. And then you had the uh, Denis. Kropotrovsk area or, you know, the clans in the east, so to speak, who said for business purposes, we need to do business with Russia. But it's it's a total cultural sphere wipeout. Right. You know, you, you, you're, you can't go both ways like that. You know, you can't say, um, you know, all your textbooks and TV constantly say we need to kill Russians and then say, oh, um, by the way, we like doing business with you. You know, it just doesn't work that way. Right. It doesn't work out. Yeah. And so I kind of feel like I, I've supported Russia's hopes. I thought they wanted a peaceful, rational you know, solution for the future of the Ukraine. But I still don't – you know what I mean? I, I, I see this huge gap between what I think they wanted and then what you can actually see based on the reality on the ground. Well, you, you know, what I think one thing they may have done is project there's a certain – I mean there's a certain number of people on the planet. There's a finite number of people. And there are a finite number of people that can be radicalized to fight. And, uh, you know, 
for example, when you look at how uh, Russia handled Libya, um, you had uh, Belhaj brigades, which are basically aimed to to do their job in Libya and then lily pad onto Syria. But, um, you know, one view is that they let the things go down a certain way in Libya to absorb a lot of the fighting and absorb the instability there uh, to wick away uh, the types of uh, people that could be used, that if, if there was no way to, to crack the nut of, of Libya, then all of the stuff would have been concentrated on Syria, and then it would have been domino effect down Syria, down Hezbollah, and then basically down Iran. Then the Caucasus are open up, you know, Dagestan, Chechnya, the whole thing comes undone. So, you know, one one view might be that the prolonged fighting in in Ukraine um, may have the effect of of killing a lot of mercenaries and killing a lot of uh, radicalized elements. There's a finite number of them, whether it's 100,000 or a million. Um, I'm sure they have numbers on that, but there are also, uh, you know, by they have successfully promoted the enemies, uh, meaning the Ukrainian side, their defeats. I think that what we see in a lot of mainstream media um, in, in that part of the world um, does talk about the defeats. And there has been a success in the information war because the Pravi sector also wants to undermine the government of Poroshenko, and there, there are different sections of them. And, and so they've also promoted these memes of, you know, of uh, unjustified losses. And that discourages people from fighting because, you know, people don't necessarily... Um, there, you know, the Novorossians have not killed innocent, you know, women and children and grandpas um, in the in the west of Ukraine. So the people who are motivated to fight on this kind of blood feud level are the pro-Russian side, and the the Ukrainian side is, you know, want they want to fight a fight they can win, but they're not, you know, they're not fighting. There's no revenge or anything like that going on, not by and large. So I think that's a big difference. Um, I think all those things play into it. Uh, and being able to bleed the enemy is a, is a big component. And I think the Russian side of this has successfully done that. Um, I do think there's been a big shift in the discourse in Europe. They are sitting in two chairs. The EU could come undone um, in the way we know it. Certainly, um, NATO hasn't been able to act uniformly um, in Ukraine either. So um, there's a lot of ways to, to, to parse that out and to look at it. Well, one question is whether Russia wants the EU to break up or not. Um, I'm not sure. Um, they don't. They don't. I, they, they like, I think they, they want... don't, but then we get back to my question of whether... I, I somehow feel like for 15 years I've been seeing that Russia has, like, a dip diplomacy of hope, <laughs> you know, Obama or something. Uh -huh. um, I, I see it as more like, is it realistic to have a united EU that, you know, isn't really under the Western financial oligarchy's control, or at least 50% control? Mm -hmm. You know, they so dominate... Uh, London and Paris and Hamburg, you know what I mean? They, they're, they're, their power is so great. And then, of course, the U.S. And then Western Europe is full of American troops and, and intelligence and spying and all that and media ownership. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you know, it, just I mean, it just seems like it's a tough fight. I mean, that, that this right, one, it's a I tough fight. It's not, you know, it's not like they it's not a it's not a walk in the park and, you know, and uh and there's no, there are no promises of victory in life or in, in these things. And I, you know, the on the Russian side, they've, they've, I mean, they basically have no choice. Um, so their their options are basically um, to get to basically to neutralize Europe, and and the 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 model of walling themselves off didn't work. That's what led to the problems in 89 to 92 in the first place. 
So they've always known they had basically um, the way that the way that Russian geo strategy, for example, in foundations of geopolitics, um, Dugan lays the foundation for understanding that the whole process in the Soviet period after the 60s was basically that they could see clearly that they couldn't hang on, right? Because they had either the peace movement that they were basically tacitly supporting in the West and detente um, was basically aimed at a Finlandization of, of Europe um, and to have it basically be neutral and not, and not have NATO just to have a, you know, you could have the U.S. and you could have the Soviet Union, but that Europe should be neutral. Um, and that that failed. They could never really support there being like a massive militarized, you know, Iron Curtain and, you know, have basically what not a porous border from from the, the Baltic to to the Balkans. I mean, it's quite impossible to maintain that all the way to the Adriatic from the Baltic Sea. So what were their solutions? What were their options? Well, you have to integrate with Europe. So you have to basically mirror the political discourse and the symbolism and the ideology of Europe. You have to do away with the statues of Marx and Lenin and, you know, all the red flags. And you've, you've got to basically, you know, you've got to put up a tricolor flag and you've got to have a president and, you know, Coca-Cola, McDonald's and all these things. I mean, what else are you going to do? I think you're right. You've been hearing the same thing for 15 years, 20 years. I mean, it, it, you know, it's been going on some time. Uh, I don't see Russia as unstable. I don't think that they're on the verge of collapse or defeat. I think that they are. I think that they've been able to hold a position pretty firmly. Um, and all of the places where they've drawn red lines, they have been successful. There's been no rollback of their efforts in Georgia. In fact, they've moved forward to recognize, uh, they're officially recognized the frozen conflict as being a breakaway in Georgia. And I think that that's a clear sign about what they might do in a plan B or plan C scenario in Ukraine. Uh, there's no uh, credible threat to the government in terms of like Putin. And there was a big scare when he was missing in the West that was kind of mongered out of hand. The Nemtsov thing didn't go down at all the way the West thought it might go down. Um, there was never a, a, a patriotic Maidan in Moscow that went down. The alliance between the nationalists and liberals, the way it went down in um, Kiev, never went down successfully in Russia. I think they've been made successful moves against the fifth and sixth column in Russia. They've continued to... Um, you know, make initiatives uh, and pursue a successful line in Iran and with China, uh, in Thailand, in Vietnam, in Latin America. So, you know, uh, they're, they're not taking over the world, Paul. I mean, they're not, they're not going to, I don't see the Russian army, you know, occupying Washington, D.C. anytime soon. But I don't think that Moscow is going to be occupied either. Oh, for sure. I, I think they're holding their own reasonably well. But, you know, looking back on it this year, if if you had been analyzing it as a, let's say, a Chinese analyst, and you were looking at what were NATO's goals, and then, you know, how well did it go for them, right? If you said there were five or ten goals that the U.S. had in right. the Ukraine, okay, um, obviously off the top of our head, one would be to get Russia out of the bases in the Crimea, and that was a total failure. As a matter right. of fact, that's that's a total failure because now Russia's been able to modernize and do all kinds of things in the Crimea. So that was a huge failure. Um, but other things did go the way the U.S. might have wanted. I think they've destroyed the uh, military-industrial complex in the Ukraine, haven't they? Um, uh, or or force Russia to ship whatever it could out on trains as quickly as possible. Uh, yeah, right. I mean, we saw that happen in in the Second World War, too, where they pulled production um, to the east. Um, you know, I well, obviously, the export industry has, has collapsed. I mean, before the start of the war, Ukraine was the fourth largest weapons exporter in the world, and that has, you know, not, not improved, right? So 
but I think that in some of the critical areas that the rebels do control, they have been able to retool. They have shops where they take, um, when they take trophies, they're able to repair them and use a lot of these facilities to maintain equipment. And, and being in such, we talked about earlier, being in such a small area, I mean, you look at a map and you keep in mind, I mean, if we're from the U.S. and we, we have this idea of distances, I mean, the distance between like dri driving from Alabama to Georgia is quite a distance, really, number of hours uh, from the center of each state. But when you look at, you know, in the middle of Donetsk or Lugansk, I mean, you can drive from one end to the other of, of these regions in question, like in an hour or less. So it's, it's you know, you can move around fairly fairly quickly, fairly easily. Um, if I were a Chinese analyst or something like that, you know, or if I were me, uh, I would say that in general, we can say that in the last year, looking back, you know, taking a multivariate analysis and looking at uh, what we've been able to draw out from, you know, our last, what, three or four um, interviews where we've dug into this question in a serious way. Um, the half dozen reports that I've made on the subject, I think we can parse out seven or eight theses uh, altogether. Uh, hey, do you want to give us some of them? <laughs> sure, sure, right. I mean, I can. Um, I don't know, but, Jerry. Uh, Jerry, you want? You got a question you want to go for first? Um, I was just going to ask about uh, Odessa and the oligarchs. Maybe we can hold off on that. And uh, we hold off to, on oligarchs until after we get some of the theses out. Yeah, sounds well, good. The, the, well, the first one is in fourth generational war, as we've talked talked about in great detail on your show, I think Russia has been fairly successful in using some of the latest methods of fourth generational warfare, decentralized combat, elimination of the clear lines between civilian volunteer and soldier, a combination of government contract mercenary combatants, ideological political soldiers. They've successfully implemented information war, lawfare, uh, combination of diplomacy, and use of a complex proxy network. I think that in relation to that, we've seen how when the Soviet Union was collapsing and you had all these oligarchs pop up and the military kind of seemed to almost disappear for a while and a lot of things were unaccounted for and the U.S. has had a difficult time approximating Russia's actual military strength because the military kind of liquefied and a lot of these oligarchs made private armies out of the Russian, out of the Soviet army and a lot of tanks disappeared, a lot of really good systems actually kind of privatized and became part of these unknown secret armies. And now we've seen these, you know, semi-private non-state um, armies emerge in Novorossiya. That's been quite exciting. So they've kind of done a judo move with that. Um, they turned a weakness into a strength um, or, the, or the illusion of a weakness. It was tucked away and then, you know, wow, what, 20, 25 years later, it gets pulled out. Um, the second thesis is the use of hyperreality that kind of connects with, you know, the, the disappear phantom army from 25 years ago. And, uh, and I've also think that in the use of new media, they've successfully used new media to create and re reaffirm this hyperreality. So, you know, they've been able to kind of convince a lot of people that the things are, are native, things that are happening are, are native to the region. And at the same time, massage in the line that Russia is involved, kind of like the frog in boiling water. I mean, the, the histrionics um, from the, well, the, the truth that they are involved has been made to seem like histrionics from the West, when in fact, when the West says that Russia is involved, they're quite right. But it's, but that they have not been able to use that fact to catalyze a sort of more robust, decisive response from NATO. So now people have kind of acquiesced or kind of they're comfortable with this idea that Russia is involved while Russia continues to deny that they're involved. Again, Israel does the same thing. And um, so you have that use of hyperreality in the simulacrum. Um, the, and the, the corollary of that is the U.S. has not really successfully managed that. And we talk about, you know, when you're on home turf and when you have real tweet, tweeter activists and people on Facebook and LiveJournal, whose lives depend on it. I mean, American, you, know, you can have like a Hasbro type thing where you're pay paying people to comment in Yahoo comment sections. And that's, you know, not the extent of what the U.S. does, but it largely characterizes it. And it's very different from real people who have real 
who are really involved, who have real accounts, because people who are following Twitter and Facebook and LiveJournal and VK, can, after a while, they can tell when they're dealing with like a troll dummy account or like a bot. And Russia is not using bots, right? They like, have a lot of activists who really care about this because um, unlike the U.S., this war, this conflict is happening, you know, in that part of the world. So the people are motivated. They are active. Um, the fourth thesis is about divided Europe. You know, we've seen in the past year, um, the EU elites do seem to contain, there was a lot of hypothesis about a, an Atlanticist tendency and a Eurasian or continental pro-European tendency, really three different tendencies. And I think we've learned that there's not two, but three, and, and they sit in some of the, you know, individuals sit in some of the same chairs. I mean, if you have like all these different companies and corporations and consortiums, that form interlocking directorates, you know, they're all chained together. They're not like they're at war with each other, but they also sit on the same bodies. So you could, so the same individuals, Hollande and Merkel, represent all those tendencies, and we can see them getting pulled in different directions, and they'll make one statement on Tuesday and then have to say something else the following Monday. Um, and then just the last ones, the fifth thesis, Ukraine is a failed state. The U.S. would like to create a failed state. Um, moving forward, because stability uh, is going to is going to um, bring Europe and Russia together. Um, that's what the U.S. in its broad goals for the region, the whole you know Mackinder theory of the heartland and you know the the periphery and the core and how you can contain the heartland. I mean, all of that is based upon dividing Europe from Eurasia. Um, hey, the um six Yes. Joaquin, if I can ask a question there, though. So do you think the U.S. would like to see a failed state in the Ukraine now? Yes, they they basically would like to see ongoing fighting. and But, just... but then that begs the question. The official story is that kolomoisky has been put into his place and that, uh, you know, the country is going to unite around the Poroshenko system and then the opposition bloc will be created and that they want to normalize an anti-Russian Ukraine. And they've switched to the long game, so to speak. This is the impression a lot of people have. Right, uh, right. Do you disagree with that? What I do, do you think that, yeah. and how, how, okay, how do you disagree? Yeah. Well, I mean, Kolomoisky didn't give up his, his um, controlling share of the companies involved and that which gave him and there was sort of a stage showdown at one point a couple weeks ago between his, some of his private army. But it hasn't stopped him, his financial angle, and he hasn't stopped funding. He's basically, there has been changes, and basically Poroshenko um, has been trying to basically juggle to stay in power, so he will vacillate. So he... So his stability is like a his ability to remain as a head of state and to use his power to you know curry favor, influence friends, and so forth, make money, and to be in charge of how the IMF money gets unaccounted for, is to um, act as a transmission belt between these different forces. And so when you see media announcements like, okay, um, the Pravi sector is going to disband that this whole system of uh, volunteer battalions is over and they're going to integrate into a single command. But this is um, a mirroring of uh, a reversal mirroring of what the Russians are doing, which is to basically say that in the Russians the Novorussians are saying that they don't have like a, a very strict centralized command. And when in fact they do, and on the Ukrainian side, they have a lot of, of infighting and they have a lot of these different contending power groups. And they're trying to act now that they have a single command. Um, they, they really are trying to get the confidence. This is kind of a their own attempt at simulacrum because they want to basically convince Europe again that they can do be normal. I mean, if, if the more that what was happening as this emerged was the more that it looked like there could be a Pravi sector coup, which would lead to an ongoing war that doesn't end, 
which is what the U.S. wants, that was alienating the, the different groups in Europe. And, and pushing them more to see the Russian position as the as the correct one. So I see this as a maneuver to to regain support from the Europeans in on that. And uh, and that and that actually is the how the failed state works. That's how it, basically it's like massive trolling. You know, trolling is like, you know, I mean, you're fishing and then the fish pulls away and you got to let a little slack and then you can reel it back in. So this is slack. To reel it back in, and um, but the U.S. has no long-term developmental or economic plans for Ukraine um, in terms of there being a state that survives. They could do like an ISIS thing where you can have you know 4,000 troops in a five square kilometer area while you do some fracking or resource extraction, like you see with ISIS in parts of Iraq or or Syria. But you don't. But they're not trying to. They're not make. They're not state building. They're not like building hospitals and schools and printing a currency and having airports and and things like that. It's basically well, like. But but Joaquin, I, I I mean I think we can all see that there isn't going to be any money for schools. You must be kidding. They're going to get rid of all the schools. But but the the question I had wasn't that. I mean, the, and the the argument people are making is that uh, to make an effective military in the Ukraine. Uh, they really need about a year, and they need to, you know, bring in specialists, training, you know, equipment and all that. And they don't need schools, but they need some time in a functioning state so that they can build up the military. And yeah. The idea is if they want to follow the Yugoslav scenario, where it takes many, many years to finally have an Operation Storm or whatever you call it, um, they have to, you know, they have to keep the state functional that long. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, there is a they have to keep the state functional. But what what people are saying is that the basically that the political independence of of, a, of or that the right sector exists as a separate tendency from the state um, is 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 over with based upon these pronouncements and whatever deal Kolomoisky made. The thing is that Kolomoisky has influence and has given a lot of money, but he's not the only conduit. There is the Svoboda, Radio Free Europe, all of these different people and Yadosh directly um, get directly money from the U.S. It doesn't just rely on Kolomoisky. So the other thing also is that uh, they will need to activate these people. And uh, and when they um, can create further uh, they need to create further uh, disruptions in the whole country, and they're not going to be able to, to do that if you don't have distinct political tendencies. Um, the ideological component is very big, and the probably sector base, they will lose support if they cannot maintain some coherent uh, independence from the Ukrainian state. They have invested so much of their propaganda and so much of their whole political line, their own credibility depends on being distinct from the Ukrainian state. I can see the point that there's some period of time that they want to like train people to be more effective. Um, I think that this is a sign of Russian strength, that they are surprised at the success of the Russian response. Um, if that has pushed them into a position of needing to consolidate um, the state apparatus um, further, well, you know, a failed state is like when you don't have schools. I mean, just to say, oh, well, you have a, a military-funded project and there's a military, um, you've got, you know, a failed state is, uh, I mean, Haiti, you know, has a military, right? But there's all these warlords and gangs in Ukraine that are doing what they want. Um, that's very different. That's, that's the reality but to project, to make announcements to the media and to European audiences that they are consolidating the armed forces um, is, not the re is not the reality on the ground. It's just that they cannot get support for their project if it looks like they're not in control. Uh, that, that is my sense of, of things moving forward. Okay. okay. I would just think, though, that if they can't keep, if they, if they really do have a warlord, you know, regional uh, situation, then the Nova Russian army will have the manpower to take over a place like Kharkov. 
Um, but if they're facing a, you know, just based on population, but if they're facing a national army of a country that's actually united and functional, they'll be outnumbered, you know, eight to one or whatever, seven to one or something. So, um, you know, I, I think that anyway, you can understand why people would think the American strategy yeah, I, would I be to try why, to, to national. Definitely why I understand why they think that. I just don't think that the plan for Nova Russia is to like overrun Kharkov or or um, Mariupol. Um, my sense is that most of the discussion about bringing the Ukrainian effort under a unified command is uh, is their attempt to use simulacrum or to create basically the impression that, that they can do this because European efforts uh, in the European position in this was being pulled, the more that Ukraine looked like they were falling apart and the more it looked like it was gonna be a free for all on the Ukrainian side, the more that this raised big concerns among the fence sitters in Europe, there are European elites, because we've described interlocking directorate, directorate and uh, the interlocking directorate is, is such that you don't really, people can be pulled in either direction because these rings are all connected. They're like the Olympic rings, right? So, you know, they needed to create this, basically get your stuff together thing and to, to make it seem like the only way that Minsk II was going to be held together, the way that Ukraine could claim that they didn't, aren't the ones that broke Minsk II, when Minsk II is finally announced to have been broken, okay? We already have Lavrov talking about, let's talk, I can entertain talking about peacekeepers, right? And when Minsk II is announced to be broken, um, Ukraine can't say um, that they fulfilled, that they attempted to fulfill their obligations because one of the criteria was about um, armed groups, uh, terrorist or mercenary armed groups that are outside of the uh, legal bodies. So commensurate with the Minsk II agreement, these uh, volunteer brigades, the OUN-inspired groups that call themselves OUN or uh, Pravi sector militias um, have to basically disband and then get put into new battalions. So, for example, like in the area, area of Apiski, you had OUN and Pravi sector brigade active there. This is near um, Donetsk. And they had to, I think, join the 93rd, um, 93rd battalion or 93rd Brigade of the Ukrainian Armed Forces. So they had to like submit and apply to the regular army. But in reality, they exist as the same unit. They just rebranded. Uh, they've got the same commanders. And I don't think that the chain of command will change too much. Um, part of the deal that has been made with some of these volunteer brigades that are funded by the US and partly by Kolomoisky other uh, secret and nefarious sources, um, they have long time envied this access to better equipment that the parts of Ukrainian army gets. And because a lot of the foreign mercenaries are integrated into the volunteer brigades because of the legal things and the extent that some of this is transparent and how you make excuses for it. So like a lot of Polish and European mercenaries are and American mercenaries uh, are integrated into the volunteer brigades and they have better training on NATO equipment than the regular Ukrainian army. But it, but because of the way the things were organized, um, it was the Ukrainian army that was getting a lot of this NATO equipment. So they had to reconcile this, this difference. So there was a deal that was made, but they're going to retain the same command structures. They're going to have access to better equipment. Just talking about the volunteer brigades, they can sell to Europe that they have their stuff together. And they can say also that they're doing their end and adhering to the provisions of Minsk II agreement, which do say that these volunteer brigades should cease to exist. So that's my view. I don't really think it's a lot of reality, though. Hmm. Okay. What about uh, some more of your theses? 
we didn't get to them all. Yeah, there's just a couple more, basically. I mean, because we can see in the past year, these things have played out. And uh, so you've got the failed state we were basically just talking about in depth just now. And what things, what are the, what is the body of confirming and disconfirming evidence? And I think that was a very good discussion on that. And, and generally what they did, as we've said, is they tried to sell in this failed state idea, the intermarium project. I mean, the whole concept of Ukraine not being dependent on Western Europe and not being dependent on Russia dates back to Polish-Lithuanian geo geopolitics from the last two centuries. And this whole intermarium project of connecting Latvia, Lithuania, Poland, Ukraine, uh, into a single economic sphere that divides um, Russia from Europe. And that's, that fits in uh, with U.S. plan, except that it's not viable. So that, but, but it is, it is um, reasonable enough to think it would be that you can get the Poles and the Lats and the Lithuanians and Ukrainian oligarchs on the same page, and, and the U.S. can create the simulacrum that they are indeed moving in that direction and by investment, bringing in Hunter Biden, fracking equipment, and by uh, making assurances to Poland that they will um, uh, you know, cover the slack that's made, for example, like when Russia cut off uh, exports from Poland to Russia, the U.S. said, oh, we're, don't worry, we'll buy the Well, they didn't buy the stuff. So we can see there's not really a real plan for intramarium because the U.S. hasn't been able to fill in the gaps that are created from the uh, from Latvia, Lithuania, and Poland, for example, being cut off from Russia. So they're actually very upset about that. The sixth thesis really is about ideology, and we can see that when the Soviet Union collapsed, you know, you had um, the nationalists were basically kind of like Pamyat and some neo Nazis, and then like Hart, which is like which are like Germanophile neo-Nazi, like Germanophile nationalists, and then Pamyat are like Russian Orthodox clerical fascists. And then um, there were like uh, secular ultra-nationalists of a Russian side. Um, that was against the communists and was really critical in the street fights and the, the, when the fighting broke out um, in, in Russia, actually there was violence. In the West, it was talked about like there wasn't violence, but there was a lot of violence in the streets. There was fighting, and it was a lot of ideological and media war, too. And that was Russia's biggest weakness. And so what they've done in the last, you know, 20 years is they've been able to cohere a kind of post-communist uh, syncretic ideology that involves the Orthodox uh, church, you know, hardline orthodoxy that involves Soviet symbolism and some overtures to the communist period that involves monarchism. So you see a lot of strange combination of symbolism and ideas of basically that these are all things that are Eurasian. So you have people like Limonov, Kurginian is more like on the communist end, Limonov with the national Bolsheviks, Dugin has moved more towards the, the right in terms of symbolism and, and language and overtures to the orthodoxy. Now he calls himself an old believer. But you've got these ultra-nationalists and neo-communists and people who 20 years ago were on opposite sides of the barricades are now like on the same side. And that has been very, very powerful in Novorossiya too, because you have monarchists like uh, people who were inspired by Strelkov, and you've got people who are inspired by the communists, and you've got people who are a mix of everything now. That's been really big on the Russian end is syncretic ideology. Um, on the Western pro-NATO side, their attempts at syncretic has been basically the liberal Nazi um, syncretization. They've tried to basically make common camp between liberals and neo-Nazis. And that's and basically what both of those have in common is is the West or Westernization. They Basically, you can see a pro-German, pro-Europe angle or a pro-EU liberal, you know, gay rights, human rights, LGBTQ um, angle uh, is also Western. So that, that's basically it's a, a world division in, in geography. You can see it. And then the ideologies pertain to that. 
So past, present, future get all combined and mixed up. It's very interesting. That's the sixth thesis. And then really just hey, the end uh, games. Of, Joaquin, yeah. before, you, before you move on, I thought I'd point something out because I thought there was a rather interesting um, interview floating around that there are translations in English of um, of the Russian think tank guy. Retnishkov or something like that. Uh -huh. um, are you familiar with this? No. No? Okay. It's been on places like Fort Rus and uh, Russia Insider. Um, the guy had been, you know, 30 years in the Russian intelligence establishment or whatever, but he's at a think tank and he was interviewed. And um, basically he was calling for syncretism. He was saying that this is a civilizational war between Russian civilization and, you know, Western civilization, and that um, basically Russia needed to integrate, you know, the old with the new, so to speak, or the historical, you know, tendencies of its past with the communist, right, and kind yeah. of move away from where it is now and to create some happy uh, median or something like that. Yeah, um, you know, I have to plead ignorance, but I mean, what it, from what you've described. It, there's a number, I mean, you know, Kurginian and Limonov and Dugan have, have also said similar. And um, and that's generally been what what we, we have seen. I mean, um, there was like the Yeltsin period. And at the beginning of it, it was, you know, the, the voices in Russia that talk about, you know, communism was the worst thing to ever happen since, you know, since, well, ever. And it was just, uh, you know... I mean, there's a lot of real um, issues and legitimate grievances that people had with that period. And there were different periods in that period. I mean, some were better than others. You know, there were periods that were more liberal and periods that were, you, know, you didn't really have the same level of persecution or, or you know, uh, uh, going after political dissidents and so forth. There were liberal periods and there were conservative periods in there. And, uh, but, and it's, you know, it would be a mistake to sort of brush aside those, those grievances, right? And uh, but at the same time, they, it was also a period of growth, of stability, of work, of, of, of peace. And uh, people had, you know, hopes and, uh, you know, children went to school and there was employment for all, generally speaking. And, um, you know, it, it's it, the, um, the, the when a society says that they're making a point or that there's a point to its society, it. it it, it really says something, and it, it's, a, it's a point of strength and unity. If a society basically says that there is no point to society, but every individual just goes on about their life, well, you haven't really said very much, and then you basically just appeal to the base instincts like consumerism or lifestyleism and things like that. So um, it's clearly um, the West does have an ideology, and one of its strengths in, in liberal ideology is to say that it's not an ideology. And it is probably the most dishonest um, ideology in that respect. Um, but it also it plays upon humans' desire to think that they're free of ideology. I mean, everyone wants to think that they're an objective and free thinker. But everyone, me, you, everyone is trapped into, you know, uh, a system of thought, right? I mean, you have to be on a pretty good acid trip to break out of that, you know, every once in a while. But other than that, I mean, you're in a system of thought. And well, um, there's also something here sounds like political correctness or something. There's kind of a, um, uh, how can I put it, uh, mandatory kindness. How's that? <laughs> or exactly. something. Well, yeah, you, right. know, you know what it I mean? It's, it's kind of like um, we insist that you be free or something. I don't know. Yeah, there's right, some element right. to it. And these are the people you have to, whose freedoms we have to champion more than others and so forth. Right. And, you know. Yeah, you know what I'm saying. Uh, okay, what about your last thesis then? The what last that? thesis basically is, well, so we talk, we had the end games. We've talked about that. So we don't have to review that. Basically, the uh, long t U.S. end game, long-term neutralization of Russia and to break Russia up into several weaker, maybe mutually hostile parts in the short term expanding instability on its borders. So whether it's Ukraine or Chechnya, Dagestan, Armenia, Azerbaijan, that's that's a goal. The Russian endgame is is also equally as difficult to achieve, maybe impossible. Uh, Eurasianization of the EU, joint development and security union from Spain to China, de facto transformation of the US from a sea power into a land power, 
that may involve some compromises, you know, uh, Russia pulling out of, of or having, you know, BRICS change its orientation away from Latin America, make the U.S. into a land power, you know, basically revival of the Monroe Doctrine, and for the U.S. to pull out of the Middle East and out of Europe and out of Eurasia, and would be would maybe to allow the U.S. to kind of refocus on Latin America. Um, it, of course, there's a lot of people in Latin America that would be very much against that. There'd have to be a whole period of truth and reconciliation, you know, whole restructuring of the culture and the discourse. A lot of apologies and new commitments would have to be made for that to be possible. But that is what is in mind. The, and finally, the eighth is just that in understanding how the media works and how Russia thinks, you know, it's often easy for us to look at a headline and then we go, oh, how is Russia going to react or how will, you know, the Germans react? And generally, at least with the Russians, they we know that they utilize game theory and that it's not, you know, like throwing darts, you know, against, you know, in the dark or whatever. And they're not they're not just uh, receiving news headlines the way we receive them and then figuring out what they're going to do next the way that we might think they do rather there's, it's like long game chess and they, you know, they know the different moves on the board. You know, if they do this, so they have basically game theory drawn out from, you know, semiotics, uh, the uh, science that was developed um, by, you know, Markov, um, stochastic events, gaming them out, infinite game. Um, a lot of it also relies on Bayesian statistics, which deal where how you can include subjective factors into statistical modeling. And uh, Russia views that the U.S. is engaged in an infinite game. So basically, uh, you can depict those as infinitely complex flowcharts. And so having um, superior computer systems and decentralized networks that can be, you know, uh, impervious to hacking uh, and things like that, which can um, d mess up if you destroy, if you tamper one digit in a formula, of in these modeling, you can get you know completely wrong results. So you have to have different systems that are working against each other or independently from each other, and then you have to compare the results because they don't always get the same results. And then there's questions as to why. But the point is that it's not just like Putin sitting around with ten guys going, "What are we going to do next?" I mean, you've got tens of thousands of people in the sciences and all the sciences that try to basically turn a lot of um, qualitative data into quantitative data and they assign variables, you know, values and they move forward with models. And, you know, the, the scientific element is really not um, always understood. And it's strange because we've even going back to World War II, Paul, um, we saw, you know, the early IBM punch card computers were used in doing all the computations of the war and logistics and, and artillery and all the mathematics from the Second World War, they were using, you know, then supercomputers, uh, vacuum tube things. We already seen the pictures, but they existed back then. People should imagine how with advanced computing and processing power and programs and advancements in mathematics and in social sciences, psychology, ideology, geostrategy and all of these combine and how they've been able to map these out into computer models. That's the eighth thesis, the last one. Sounds like the foundation by Isaac uh, Asimov. It does. And that's a pretty amazing thought. But then, uh, but by the same token, though, uh, Joaquin, uh, presumably Russia had all these scientific minds 15 years ago or five years ago or whatever. And I'm not impressed with what they achieved in the Ukraine. <laughs> Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, their highest achievement was an opportunistic calculation when they got the Crimea, you know, very well executed, very well performed. You know, their special forces are doing a great job now and all that. And I, you know, I'm impressed. And even the politics afterwards, you know, I think they did a good job. But you know what I'm trying to say from a strategic yeah, yeah. point of view? They, they saw know. these problems. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah. I mean, like, I don't I don't maybe we're, you know, qualifying our terms differently. I mean, like if uh, if if a hundred pound man, you know, is fighting a 200 pound man and the hundred pound man is able to escape getting beat up and is able to like trip the 200 pound guy and get him dizzy. I mean, I'm impressed with what the hundred pound guy has done. He didn't, you know, choke out or KO the 200 pound guy in the ring. 
but he avoided getting his butt kicked. And I mean, I see Russia as the hundred pound guy. It's not, you know, uh, it's not a superpower. It is only a nuclear superpower, but it is not a superpower. It is a regional hegemonic power. And um, it would be more like, the thing is that, of course, and you're, you're above this and you see through all this, but, you know, the average person in the West has been told that Russia is simultaneously weak enough to destroy, but also too powerful to ignore. And um, part of that might be true, but when, when U.S. action against Russia is justified, it tends to overstate their capacity. Um, they are not a superpower. And I think they've done, I mean, I'm impressed with what the 100-pound guy has done in the ring with the 200-pound guy. Um, but, uh, but again, you know, it's like we're sort of, I don't know, looking at things in hindsight, and there's always advantages to looking at things in hindsight. And we're also deprived of a lot of the data and inside information. You know, the extent to which Putin is surrounded by enemies may be greater than we realize or less, or the extent to which the U.S. has their stuff together may be greater than we realize as well. I mean, the U.S. has a lot of advantages. They, they didn't really let a lot of things slip uh, in the period of time between the collapse of the Soviet Union and today, they certainly went, basically declared war on the world. Um, and I don't, but I don't see that Russia's victories should be seen as a counter polarity, but rather if we see a general increase in the world of multipolarity, then we can include Russian victory in their aims within that. They don't want to dominate, uh, in a, as a colonial or imperial power. They just want sovereignty in their sphere, their historical sphere of influence. And if we can see multipolar India, multipolar Latin America, multipolar Eurasia, those are how we define the victory for them. So that's how I look at it anyway. Uh, sure. I mean, I think that's totally fair. And th there is no, you know, we don't have access to more than whatever. 10% of the information that matters or something. Right. So we're kind of we're kind of guessing. But I, I would just generally uh, uh, let me phrase it differently. I bet that after the coup in Ukraine, the 5 years after that versus the 5 years before it, Russia's I don't know how you want to call it, diplomatic approach, <laughs> NGOs, all kinds of things, propaganda, you name it, all kinds of things will be dramatically better. Definitely. I mean, you know, it's um, I, having the right ideas. There's there's been people in Russian elite circles and academic and analysts who've been saying these things for a long time. And Putin and his inner circle ha see it, too. Um, it's, you know, bureaucratic inertia is is a killer, though. It's like it's like, you know, changing the direction of the Titanic, you know. Getting a whole state to kind of realize and catch up with the changes. I mean, you said it, I think, best a few times ago. We were talking that, you know, things like RT, Russia should have had that in the Soviet period. They should have had that in the 80s when cable TV came out, when satellite TV came out. They should have launched instantly, right? And it took them another, what, 15 years to catch up to that. So if they can catch up, you know, uh, in less time, I mean, they you had so many people, so many bad policies, so many stupid careers, you've got nepotism, you've got, you've got people who hire their cousins and uncles and sons for no good reason except that they're family. And that's part of the human experience. A lot of organizations dysfunction that way. But um, I think that is probably helps to account for um, some of the retardation of needed changes on the Russian side. Joaquin, as a kid, I enjoyed uh, reading Soviet propaganda, they had something called, I think it was called Soviet Life or Soviet Boys Life or something in the 60s, late 60s, early 70s, whatever. It was quite well done, actually. Um, so it's not like they couldn't do it. It's just that they didn't have the, um, the push at the top. Um, okay, well, thanks for the theses, but why don't why don't I ask a, a, a related question to the surprises? Um, were there any surprises on the U.S. end? There's what Russia did, but what about what the U.S. did? Or, I don't know, what Germany did or something. Anything on that end that surprised you? You know, that's, um, I've actually, um, you know, again, not really surprises. 
analytically not not you know there aren't weren't really any, like with the russian side there really weren't any surprises from what we sat down and said we thought would would probably happen but it's on an emotional level um you know it, i'm surprised it's 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 more like when you get surprised that your thesis is confirmed or when you're surprised that things happen the way you thought you know because it's because we're surrounded by so much information that's trying to convince us otherwise that when the thing happens that you thought would happen it's surprising and um and i you know what i'm surprised but we could have predicted is that you know the us has been unable to convince uh you know its its allies um has been unable to effectively contain or stop uh, Russia economically. I mean, um, the ploy, the ploy with the oil prices and the ruble and isolating Russia. I mean, every time they announce something, every time that the Western media ramps up talk about isolated Russia, you know, the Russians go and sign some new trade deal. Um, with an important player, whether it's the uh, ASEAN countries, Malaysia, Thailand, and stuff like that, um, Indonesia, or the Chinese deals, or when uh, elections happen um, in Greece and the Greeks say we want we want to open up to Russia, um, when they go into Latin America, I mean all these things. I mean I'm surprised at at you know what a paper tiger the U.S. is in these spheres. In, in terms of economically being unable to isolate Russia, um, that's surprising in a way, on an emotional level, it's surprising because it cuts against so much of what we've been hardwired to believe since we were children from the U.S. Hmm. Okay. I'm actually, I don't know if, I, I thought that Europe would kind of stand, I don't know, more obviously for peace than they have. So what Europe is doing now, I, I, you know, if Russia had openly in, invaded and all that, I, I thought then the EU would be quite anti-Russian for sure. It would be a, a diplomatic disaster. But I thought that there would be more political pressure within the European establishment um, sooner. I'm surprised they've been able to ignore, you know, basically massive killing of civilians and so on and so forth inside Europe. I mean, next to right. EU countries. So right. I, um, I, 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 I think they're getting tired of it. They're having a lot of problems now. <laughs> yeah, and they're afraid yes. of the failed state. But I thought that would happen sooner. I didn't think they could hold, you know, the, this kind of thing going a whole year. Right. I mean, we're having this conversation in April, and I thought that a lot of these things would be hammered out in January or February, um, as we talked about before, and they're not. And I'm, I'm, I'm with you. I, I'm surprised at that. At the same time, I do think we see some indications, or maybe that's some simulacrum also, but I mean, you have Hollande and Merkel talking, saying, you know, on the day that uh, Cyprus meets with Putin, and they're talking about energy markets and Turkish stream and f exporting fruit and vegetable produce to Russia from Greece, uh, circumventing Russia's ban on the EU in response to the sanctions. Uh, these are all very interesting, or when some of these deals with Greece might be done in such a way uh, to basically be a type of a, of a secret aid, you know, I mean, you can you can have deals that are so obviously favorable to Greece that it's a form of aid. And um, and when you see those and then when and then when Merkel and Hollande are asked to comment about that and they say, oh, we're for that. In fact, we're in Russia, too, right now. <laughs> I mean, they said we are in Russia as well and we're EU and they and uh, and that seems very different. It's like the uh, good cop, bad cop. It seems like Hollande and Merkel they say these statements and it placates or addresses it it reflects the position of the eu uh europeanists and the eu eurasianists who see that the future is with china and russia on the landmass and in and in, and in development projects and economics military even too and um and then when brussels says its things or you have uh 
the announcements from the uh, head of the EU parliament or from, you know, Catherine Ashton's friends, they actually say quite opposite things. I mean, they sound like they're giving NATO talking points. Um, but we do see this cleavage and we can see, now it doesn't mean these people really think what they're saying, but, but in, in the sense that things are scripted, um, the fact that these things are said, they do represent real tendencies within Europe. So, uh, you know, I try, well, uh, you know, yeah. Do you, you know, it might be worth moving on to the question of, do you think there will be a war, as in a bigger war? A lot of people now think the Minsk II is falling apart and that finally both sides now have armed themselves properly. And so this could be, uh, you know, much more devastating than before. You know, that I think that um, what Europe has communicated, if I were, I mean, this is a guessing game, right? But they're educated uh -huh. guessing games and so forth. I, I would think that Europe's commitment that where they have, I mean, if you can conceptualize three camps, you know, the ones, there's the European, we're talking about in Europe and Europe's position on this, because I think we have pretty accurately this whole time for a year now sketched out that, that you know, Europe is like the swing vote in the, in the runoff election, right? Uh -huh. and, uh, and I think that the Europeans are dead set against... Uh, a bigger war because I think that the without getting without belaboring the different like detailed description of the different factions of Europe no not all of the Atlanticists in Europe are pro-war I mean they just think that they can make more money and maintain power in Europe going with the US but they still believe in like things like development and economic progress they're not bent on the failed state there are EU Atlanticists who will purely make money from when the U.S. makes money or purely succeed with the U.S. and they would support, you know, bombing of Paris or bombing of Berlin, even as Europeans they would. So even the Atlanticists are divided. The Europeanists in Europe would support Eurasianists or Atlanticists based upon what's best for Europe. A European army that's not part of NATO people who are Eurasianists or who are for peace, which are not the same thing per se at all, but they would are worried about a European army, but a European army presents the possibility of the semi-independent German intelligence having a part in the military intelligence of a European army, and that would be distinct from NATO, and that would represent a big cleavage and independence for Europe, and the Europeanists are trying to juggle the, the Eurasianists and Atlanticist tendencies in Europe. Then you have the Eurasianists whose business ventures and their their sense of the vision and the future are completely tied in with, with Russia. Now, that said, now with that sketched out, I think that all the Europeanists and all the Eurasianists um, make up, the have the strong together on the position of war against Russia have the most weight and they are against the war with Russia. And I think that if things look like they're going to get worse, that they will support Russian initiatives like uh, basically mm, allowing to maintain the fiction that everything Russia has done is legal um, in the sense of international law, where in the sense that there could be arguments that there are not, but they would not even look at those arguments. And furthermore, they would even support some type of European and uh, and Russian peacekeeping mission, uh, you know, they would use the language of the e of the, of the UN without really having a UN mandate, similar to how the U.S. has done things like in Iraq. Um, they could even cite the um, way that the Minsk II. They can cite the way that Minsk II was memorialized as a security uh, as a Security Council resolution without necessarily getting a, a Security Council resolution in support of action. The U.S. did that in Iraq um, uh, in, in the beginning of, of 2000s um, with Saddam Hussein, or no, when Clinton, rather, was, uh, was president and he bombed Iraq. It was, they used the language of a U.N. Security Council resolution, but it actually was not a U.N. 
Security Council res uh, approved action. So there's these little gray areas, I think, where a EU army or German or French forces could be deployed alongside uh, Russian forces. Um, they could even use the auspices of the joint inspection um, regime of the OSCE and the Russian general staff who are on the ground, um, who are observers. They could use kind of these framework to, to justify a, a, a overt Russian intervention. Um, it could even mean a regime change in Kiev in that event, um, if war really looked like it was going to get tremendously worse. Um, that said, Paul, I do think there is a degree of resumption of fighting that we should expect by May, nevertheless, that if it does not get worse than the fighting which brought about um, Minsk II, then it will be allowed. So I think that's the middle road, um, that we're likely to see a resumption of fighting without it escalating to the point that Europe is, is more overtly forced to, to pursue support uh, for uh, a Russian intervention. Hmm. Well, I mean, we're just speculating on what will happen with the, um, I guess you would say, with, in Europe, and I don't really think they have positions, you know what I mean? As you say, they're like these three factions, and it's all calculated anyway. It's not like they have principles exactly. Right. So um, that, that makes it harder for us to figure it out. But, you know, the BND said they thought there'd been 50,000 deaths so far, right? Yes. And if it's another 50, I don't think that's going to make anybody in Europe change his mind. <laughs> that's right. Uh, so let's just put it in harsh reality. Two million yes. refugees, you know, fleeing into Poland. Yeah, that'll change the opinion of the Polish government. And they'll yes. go crying to Merkel. Right. Yes. But that'll only happen when they actually see the cars pulling out of the driveway. <laughs> Exactly. You know what I mean? It right. won't happen exactly. on, on morality until it's a problem, is what I'm right. trying to say. Right. Because right. we're dealing with people who don't have a heart button. You know, they don't have much there. That's just it's it's just for calculating. So yeah. we'll see. Um, well, let's see. What are some other topics we might want to go over? I think um, we might want to get into the oligarchical situation. Um, a little bit because it's so important there. I mean, it's actually important in the U.S., but for some reason we kind of ignore it. Um, there are these uh, families of cartels and whatever that run things, and their fights have probably led to this war in the first place. That's um, right. They've had a dysfunctional economic system based on plundering what was left over from Soviet times. Right. And a lot of people don't realize that, but this is one of the tragedies of the Ukraine. You've had a system that has been dysfunctional mostly the whole time. And um, so... How do you see the oligarchical situation playing out? Some see that just more and more of them are going to go broke and die. Like Akhmatov uh, didn't make his payments a couple days ago, and he's like the supposedly was the richest man in the country. Um, any any thoughts on this? Well, you know, I think people like Akhmatov decided are in favor of federalization and are in favor of of uh, tacit support for the Russian side in, in the conflict. And, um, you know, Kolomoisky has, uh, you know, is not someone who people take seriously uh, as a man of his word. They don't, they don't, you know, he is um, someone who does not seem to have a, can't look at himself from anyone else's point of view. So he, he thinks he's being very credible when people are like, look at this fat liar. You know, and uh, he he thinks that he can talk his way out of anything, and he can't. And um, he has tried to make overtures to the Novo Novorossian side. He has tried to make press releases saying that you know the things that the Ukrainians have done were wrong, and they never should have privatized. I mean, this guy, every single buck that this guy made was from privatization, and now he's saying that basically what we're saying that you know that the whole oligarch system in Ukraine was built off of plunder of the Soviet system. So, you know, they're going to say things, they got their talking points. And, but I think, I think you're right that um, they are basically in this situation because of, of the practices 
um, that was the U.S. plan, was to set up all these oligarchs and have them set upon each other. That was how they figured out they could, you know, run the whole thing down. Uh, plunder and lack of repair and just people privatizing things. I mean, think about all of the um, high-end tech, uh, high-end production things that were converted into making, like, Chinese toys, you know. That, that was rampant in the 90s. Factories were converted from producing... Uh, parts and uh, high high end te technical equipment, um, a lot of furbishing involved. Into you know, they converted it into very low very low end, uh, low value uh, consumer um, goods, cheap plastics and toys and things like that. Um, Russia was able to turn it around, I think, by and large, and they're going to and they are halfway in that process. Ukraine never got going. It's almost like these uh, these oligarchs are like a modern day aristocracy, and they've each got their little fiefdoms. Right, they are. I mean, it's um, it, it's important also not to you know orientalize or the subject too much. I mean, there's not it's not like the West has like you know meritocracy and clean capitalism. I mean, basically we're just talking about cap what crony capitalism is. I mean, not not the libertarian ideal model, but the reality of of it, how it how it actually plays out um, has all these defects. I mean, just like socialism is not the Marxist utopian model either. I mean, it, it has a way that it has worked out. It has its strengths and its weaknesses. Um, crony capitalism is capitalism. Oligarchical capitalism is capitalism, and the same in the West. But in the West, you know, we don't talk about the DuPonts and the Rothschilds and the Rockefeller clans so much. And, you know, but it's easy for those in the West who write for liberal establishment magazines and newspapers to refer to Russian capitalism as if it's some sort of second rate mafia type capitalism, you know, and that's a that's a big uh, obfuscation of the reality. I mean, it's the same in France and in same in England. Wa and Joaquin, so forth. there's a huge difference in the West. Our oligarchs did it 100 or 200 years ago. Right. So right. now the. Now the gangsters are the great grandchildren, right? Of gangsters, right? And over right. there, you're looking at the real deal, <laughs> right? 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 That's kind of the biggest difference I see is that some of these guys actually are killers, as opposed to like third generation killers. <laughs> right? Right? Exactly. Yeah. I mean, it's like the you know, and 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 there can be interesting strengths and weaknesses built into that because it's like in the generation of when the when the mafias are get established um they uh you get a lot of uh people who are the most effective you know not necessarily good ways but you know they are the cream that rises to the top but um but um you know, at the same time, you know, and when you have multi-generationally established wealth, like in the U.S., and these oligarchical clans are more established, the children may not, you know, they haven't used guns or been shot at or have really had to organize rackets. They have advisors and the family has, you know, lawyers and they have people who manage their portfolios, right? So it's, um, there could be weakness in, in that Western, you know, multi-generational uh, elites, in that they get soft. Well, um, no question about that. Yeah, Jerry, got a question? Yeah, it's so, sort of a bit of a segue in, into another subject. But uh, last time you were on, Joaquin, you talked about um, that there'd be, mm, let's say, increasing insurgency uh, type attacks in Kharkov and Odessa. And uh, yeah, sure enough, we've actually been seeing um, more and more of that. I was just wondering what your thought was on how that's progressing. And if you think all of these attacks are actually being done by um, by the separatists, or do you think some of them are actually staged events? Both. It could, you know, on the last question, it could go both ways. I mean, it, in each case, without belaboring it, you have to look at the exact target and then the way media framed it, how like the Kiev Post reported on it, um, and and what and how the Novorossians reported on it, and then you can kind of dig in whether it was like a false flag or if it was a real attack. There are real attacks. There are um, insurgent, you know, pro Novorossian insurgent groups operating in these places. Like you said, increasingly, um, as we forecasted that that they would, um, you know, putting dates on things is like 
can instantly discredit you. But I mean, I would suspect that that given that the um, Victory Day, what May eighth or so, is going to be so so big this year because it's like what the seventieth anniversary or something like that, or what. And it's um it's a big thing, and it's it's polarized the whole issue of of Russia, and it's kind of it's kind of going to be bigger than Sochi in in many ways, and um and that's why it seems that and because it because of the symbolic nature of the victory over fascism, and the war happening in Ukraine, I think that perhaps something like in Odessa, Mariupol, Kharkov could pop up um, in a big way by then. I think that the Ukrainians know this, and that's why that we have seen this Easter resurgence of fighting. If they can get things crazy with the fighting, if they can get the ceasefire to break before May 8th, then I think that it can uh, destabilize some of the efforts in, in, um, to have these insurgent uh, uprisings. Um, recently, the um, a committee, um, the committee, the type of committee that was formed that declared Kharkov, Lugansk, and Donetsk independence um, has appeared now in Odessa and has made a similar declaration. Um, just like in the, just like in in Kharkov and Donetsk and Lugansk, it was a small committee, five or ten people, and they basically announced that this dual party, dual power organ exists. Um, but like with Kharkov, it didn't take off. And I don't know if it's going to take off in Odessa or not. Um, it's premature to, 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 see, to say for me, probably all the data is there, but I, I have been unable to get to analyzing that data. So, uh, you know, but Odessa, you know, recently, well, I think, yes. Joaquin, some of us cynics, um, think the difference is simply the effectiveness of suppression. In Kharkov, in Odessa, the uh, authorities, or whatever you want to call them, the enforcers, uh, did their job well. And in, uh, in the Donbass, they screwed up. And maybe that was due to Akhmatov's, you know, wimpiness or whatever. But, um, you know, there are two sides to tango, right? There's how You're effective right. the, the police are. Right? Yes. Why do revolutions happen? It's not because people are poor. It's because the authorities get incompetent. <laughs> right, right. And other yeah. superpowers offer help. I mean, the United States won its revolution because the other superpower of the day, France, helped. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> you know? And in the case of Kharkov or Odessa, it's a question of how much help they get. Right, exactly. And also the demographics on the ground and the, the media part of it is – also very important, you know, in Donetsk and Lugansk, what was critical there also was that you had a lot of um, the majority of people identified as ethnic Russians. And then overlapping that were also, so you have a lot, so basically people are um, Orthodox um, Christians, but they identify, they, they recognize the, the um, Moscow patriarchate, right? So they don't, the different like autocephalous and and breakaway there's like two or three and then there's the greek ortho the greek catholic which is catholic um that's not an issue but in kharkov you do have a higher ukrainian population and and in kharkov um the you have more communists than you did in um as opposed to in numerically statistically speaking than as opposed to people who are just Orthodox Christians of the, of the Moscow Patriarchate, so that makes it a different game, right? So, so the, it's on the propaganda; it's a different equation. It's going to have more of a red flag, Soviet nostalgic element to it in in Kharkov, um, which is still a powerful meme in Donetsk and Lugansk. Don't get me wrong, but I'm saying it will have to focus more overtly on that. With Odessa, again, very similar. Odessa is you know, way over in the in the southwest, it's it's you know, um, far from Russia, um, because of the Soviet period, um, and even during the Tsar, there's a, a lot of ethnic Russians in Odessa in the urban populations, but the surrounding area is like, um, you know, Bessarabians, Romanians, um, 
Transcarpathians and stuff like that. So that is a different equation. I guess, um, you know, as the the Ukrainian economy sort of tailspins uh, or sort of swirls down the toilet bowl, I guess, um, you know, I, I think more and more people that maybe were on the sidelines are going to actually get frustrated and uh, start supporting some of these insurgencies. I and and may, maybe that's even part of Russia's game, right, to freeze the conflict, um, sort of let Ukraine tear itself apart and uh, you know once it gets to a certain point of critical mass then maybe they'll support it a little more overtly right I mean both sides are playing with fire here because they do what they want things to heat up and they they're you know the it's the use of catalysts right and uh, these these catalyst a- agents and reactive agents are they're you know everyone's a chemist here and they're playing with it's all you know political science and stuff so how how the same collapsing economy is also affecting Galicians who are radicalizing and they're further supporting the Pravi sector in the historically Galician areas. But there's also Galician independence movement that is part of this Pravi sector idea. I mean, for the in a sense, the Ukrainian identity is like an agreement between Galicians and Russians. But it's also the way that Galicians have seen Ukrainian identity is the way that the Germans saw the Galician identity. So in other words, the Germans were like, how can we get Russians to kill Russians? Well, we can have these Galician Slavs to kill the Slavs and and convince them that they're more like us and that we can turn them against the Ukrainians, you know, than Russians. And Uh, likewise, yeah. I was just going to say, at this point, you, one might even speculate that Russia has a vested interest in the uh, Galician separatists. Yes, exactly. That's that things could spin that way, and also, likewise, if the and you know, um, there are people who have attacked me for suggesting this because it really goes against the propaganda war, and it's it's does it's not a convenient narrative. But most of these things are like subterfuge and intrigue, right? So if they can, behind the back door, if Russia can influence the Pravi sector to focus on independence of Galicia, that could be a good plan C or plan B4 or whatever. And, uh, and if they can also then use that to pressure Poland, right? Because the other part of Galicia is the entire southern part of Poland. And actually, uh, Krakow could be capital of Galicia, really. And um, so it's not just Ukraine. The Galician territory is also Poland. So that's the other issue. Now, if those guys are turned against Poland, the U.S. has an angle there, too. The U.S. might be behind that push also if it wants to bring Poland into the conflict. The real issues are whether things are used as pressure points to, to, to push you over to push for peace or if things are used as pressure points to like tear things apart to increase the fighting in the area. Um, The Russians and Europeans do not want fighting to get worse and worse. So all their tampering and toying with these different contending sides and all those intrigues are all meant to contain the situation, cool it off. And all the American things, if things get worse and worse and worse, generally we can see that that is the the American plan working. So that's how I have it framed anyway. Um, Yeah, it's quite a three-dimensional game of chess. Um, Just one more more point I was going to make was that a lot of people had speculated that um, it was sort of within the U.S. interests and within their plans to have a failed state on the Russian border and, you know, that Russia would eventually have to dump a pile of money and to fix Ukraine. But... I think how the Russians might be playing it is that by keeping the conflict uh, frozen, um, they're sort of forcing the IMF and the West to dump billions and billions into the Ukrainian economy. And I mean, at some point, I would think that they've got to say, you know, maybe we should cut our losses here. That's exactly what's been happening. And we've also discussed this much before um, on the show. And the more that the, you can get the U.S. and Europe to spend on it, you know, then Russia has successfully um, reversed, uh, put a reversal on on this because um, 
you know, uh, well, there was a rumor recently that Poroshenko told Putin to, to take, you know, uh, to take Donbass and Lugansk areas, the parts that the rebels hold, and just take them, you know. And, and, and the rumor was that Putin said, you know, no thanks. Um, uh, if that's true, I can imagine Putin thinking, you know, no thanks, we'll take Kiev, you know. But, um, <laughs> but you know, it's an interesting thought as well, as, you know, not just as a thought experiment, but in fact, you know, um, the Russians have taken on the funding of, of the areas that Ukraine has cut off. I mean, the social services... Um, a lot of infrastructural basic things in the rebel-held areas are being financed by Russia. And and the bigger the area that the rebels hold, and this gets back to, I think, the first question that Paul raised at the top of the hour, um, the bigger the area that the rebels control is the bigger the area that Russia has to finance during this frozen conflict period. And the smaller the area, the more that Ukraine controls militarily, the more that they are subsidize the more that they are financing and having to use their IMF to pay for I mean you know keeping the lights on and water running and you know sewage um, that is expensive and they don't have a viable tax base that you know the industry is in the rebel held territories um, with the exception of of areas around Kharkov but they've lost something like 30 or five or 40 percent of their industrial productive capacity just from the uprising and that's significant they can't pay for it they never could i mean they're already 15 or 20 billion um, euros in debt um before things started now they're an additional 50 or 60 billion in debt so so it, it's essentially i mean it's i don't know I, I from my perspective like i i really don't know how much longer they can keep the country afloat i mean i a year Max, I don't know. Right. I mean, ideally, ideally, right. What the what the Russians are like, ideally, and I think Paul is is right to not be optimistic, right, or overly impressed. But I think that ideally, they Russians are waiting for Europe to beg Russia to occupy the whole country, not militarily, but basically to affect the regime change, where you just basically replace the top five hundred or thousand people in charge of the state, like intelligence, military, civilian government, and with those 500,000 people, reorient Ukraine. And uh, um, I don't think that Russia wanted Ukraine to be like a neutral country or like a Switzerland. That's the role. That's for France. France is supposed to be <laughs> France is supposed to be the country that mitigates the German Russian alliance uh, with England. And I think that is actually, they, they, they see that neutral turf much farther to the West. And I don't want to stoke NATO fears or, you know, Russian, anti-Russian paranoia. But I mean, geostrategically, Ukraine is not the neutral place. Ukraine is definitely the pro-Russian sphere. The only question is, you know, how much of the Balkans is pro-Russian and how much of Poland and Germany is pro-Russian? I think that, um, even Germany being split in half was not viable. You know, the only viable way is really for, you know, maybe Brittany and Normandy parts of France to be under British control as part of the Anglo empire, but for the rest of Europe and uh, Eurasia to be a single economic military entity. I, I think the uh, Finland, what do they call it? The Finland is Finlandization, yeah, Finlandization yeah. Of, of Ukraine. I think that was sort of the, uh, good cop routine of the the western cfr type crowd exactly. and I, I i think they would have been totally happy with that knowing that um yeah it'll it'll be neutral for now but you know damn well that the ngos and and uh the brain trusts are going to pick apart at it and keep pulling it to the west right right hey. right and the russians also said neutral ukraine and they meant something else by it too hey i i guess it's time to interrupt since we're talking about things that may make NATO people unhappy or paranoid, um, it is widely discussed. I see it. At, I look at a lot of Russian media. It is widely discussed that really from a longer term point of view, Russia basically has to integrate the Ukraine or let's say two thirds of it. Let Galicia go to Poland. Let Transcarpathia go to Hungary or whatever. Be independent. Right. But two thirds of it needs to 
Uh, it doesn't have to be called part of being part of Russia necessarily, but it could be some. You know what I mean. Puerto Rico is right. independent, not independent. Right. Exactly. Um, it could be some kind of structure where Russia has to subsidize it and be responsible for it. But, you know, maybe they can keep flags of different sorts if they want. Or, you know, obviously to do this, you've got to have a certain amount of buy-in from uh, Europe or at least key elements like Germany. Right. But, but you could kind of imagine that as a reasonable goal for them because I th would think one lesson you've got to get out of this is you never want this to happen again. Exactly. <laughs> right. Right. I mean, exactly. Right. I mean, you're going to go through spending hundreds of billions of dollars and, and, you know, fear of nuclear war, you know, sitting in the bunker under the Kremlin or whatever uh, when things get tense. Um, it's a good time to resolve this problem. And, and the question is how. And then if you really want conspiratorial uh, thinking, I mean, some people have suggested that really what Russia might be up to or the Kremlin might be up to, but they could never say it to anybody. Right is to see the Ukraine basically bankrupted and desperate and destroyed. And the advantage of that is if, you, if all of the oligarchs run out of money and the people there are totally desperate, it will be much, much cheaper. Um, and the EU will be more willing to go along with Russia taking ownership. Right. Now, this is something you can never say because Russians and Ukrainians are perpetual brothers and... We all love each other on earth, right? Mm -hmm. We're all going to live together in Christian harmony. But <clears throat> in the meantime, there is that possibility that some have talked about. Well, you, and, it's, yeah. you, and it's ugly, but on the other hand, I'm just saying, you know, just strictly speaking, you know, if you've got a guy who has a middle class life by Eastern European standards and he doesn't particularly care for Russia, well... He's going to be harder to deal with than if you've got a guy who's starving. Right. And Russia pays a transnational police force to restore order and give him food. You know? Right. And right. if the oligarchs are gone, if people like Kolomoisky and all these other guys have to go hide in Switzerland or Israel, then you can – you know, you can plunder, you can privatize yourself. You can, you can do to them yes. what they did to Russia 15, 20 years ago. Right, exactly. Yeah, it's, um, you know, I, what I would tend to think is that, you know, what is that uh, Ukraine has some natural resources. And only when those, only when those are coordinated with Russia and those resource extraction uh, is, um, is done using you know highly advanced equipment, industrialized, modern, super modern equipment, and if that's integrated with the Russian economy. Then that's why Russia benefits from Ukraine. I mean, land doesn't have any value by itself. Human beings create the value, and human beings extract resources, and then. The questions revolve around now, is it more profitable or does it make you stronger or does it build a long-term goal if you extract the resources and then transport them for assembly or if you – or to, on the other hand, if you, employ, if you also build production sites. So if you're extracting ore and then you're melting, smelting steel and then you're – you know, and then you're producing things from steel and then you export it or if you just take – you know, iron and, and, you know, metals, and then you smelt them elsewhere. That's the kind of, that's the, those are the questions. I think that the way the Russians understand all this is that you need an industrialized, strong Ukraine that's a region of a larger Russian sphere of influence, not, not an impoverished Ukraine. Uh, that, you know, that's not how they, and, and that's not how they at least figured things for but, the last... 50 years. Yeah, but Joaquin, the problem is the country hasn't been modernized, so their industry is is becoming further and further out of date. Yes, and that has that has been a further weakness for for Russia. The whole basically the conflict we're talking about a frozen conflict. It's actually been a frozen conflict in Ukraine, really an economic war with the with Eurasia with Russia and the West 
since 91. And actually, the Ukraine was taken out of, of, of uh, the Russian Federation, so to speak, uh, against the wishes of, of Ukrainians. They had a referendum and they, they, they wanted to change the socialist part of the constitution, but they wanted to remain part of the Soviet Union. The, what the agenda item, what was on the vote of the day, was to call it the Union of Soviet Republics and just to drop the socialist part. But it was going to be the USR, you know, instead of the USSR. And that, and, and there was never, the whole economic war has been the whole time. And so like Russia, knowing, Russians knowing that they don't really control Russia, they don't have solid control over Russia, over Ukraine, excuse me, knowing that the Russians don't control Ukraine, they uh, were not going to invest, you know, and really build it up. Why would they build it up to be what it needs to be when it can just flip over to Poland or Germany or, you know? Well, uh, if you've got, you know, Kolomoisky's, you know, violent gangs on the street, <laughs> I mean, and you're a Russian businessman, that doesn't sound very enticing. Not at all. Not at all. Right. I mean, the, but the whole idea that, I mean, for our, you know, NATO friends, I mean, the in the partners, cold truth partners the cold, I was joking. the truth of this has been I mean Lavrov has said now numerous major events numerous public statements that the goal of Russia is to build a common security and economic zone from uh, Iberia to Siberia I mean that that is they have that is their policy and they have put it point blank to the Europeans like you know we are integrating that is our goal to integrate an entire security and economic zone security means the military so that's like very very profound statement that Lavrov has said in the last only month or two and as things have as the discourse has escalated they really just said they've really just shown you know they've they've made it official public you know uh, policy uh, point. This is this is like you know this is, they've known they need to do this for a long time. But the guy who was saying it 20 years ago was Dugan, and like okay yeah you know he's the crazy guy on the fringe, and they went through this whole period of having like Surkov, uh, Vladislav Surkov, the uh, you know sovereign democracy. You know Russia is a sovereign state. You know appear among equals. We respect the sovereignty of all countries. We don't want you know. Any, we just want to have sovereignty over Russia and our historical friends and, you know, Europe, independent Europe for Europeans and a separate entity. And now they're emerging out of this phase ever since, like, really this conflict in Ukraine has served as a catalyst to, like, expedite this process of rolling out their plan. Like, you know, it's the Eurasian Union. It's the whole continent, including the European Peninsula. Yes, quite ambitious. Um, well, I tell you what, we've been uh, going for a while here. Are, we should wrap it up soon. Are there any uh, thoughts you want to uh, cover before we uh, close? You know, I, I would just say to, to summarize that um, we probably will see um, uh, Minsk II will fall apart on the ground but it will be spoken of as, as as if it still holds. And um, while at the same time that we hear increased reports of hostilities and belligerence, that uh, at the same time you will get statements from Hollande and Merkel and Putin reaffirming their support to the Minsk II agreement. Um, I also forecast that there will be disruptions within the unified Ukrainian command and after um, the next um, mid to small level defeat of a Ukrainian effort that you will see Yadosh talking about pulling out of something or, you know, he's going forward with his uh, dual power plan to, you know, directly march on Kiev and challenge Poroshenko. We'll see a return to that rhetoric at the same time as we see uh, increase in, in Kharkov 
and Odessa and Mariupol of independence of local indigenous, you know, uh, uh, efforts to to buck the Kiev junta on a local level, and um, and at the same time as that occurs, uh, we will see again. Uh, more IMF, you know, we need more money, you know, money is not enough, and blah, blah, blah. And then Russia saying, we will forgive this, and we'll give you this. And so I, I think it's like, sounds like more of the same, but it's actually escalating. And it's going to go uh, until um, Europe uh, says, okay, uh, Russia uh, and Germany will make a joint peacekeeping force under the observation of the OSCE, uh, and they will cite the UN Security Resolution on Minsk II without having a UN Security Council resolution, and they may go in uh, and effectively uh, um, disarm uh, the Ukrainian army in some way. Hmm. They wouldn't just go to the front and, you know, kind of force them back in both directions or something? Well, that's how it would start. But as we saw in the war in um, Yugoslavia, it, it, even though they go in like to ostensibly neutral way, um, we know that the Dutch peace, peacekeeping forces in, in um, Bosnia like totally uh, went on the side of the U.S. and NATO, and uh, even though it was under um, U.N. auspices. So I think that, uh, you know, that that. Yeah, that's where they would implant themselves, and it would be under that pretext, Paul, you're absolutely right. But I think that if it was the Russians with anyone, uh, it would definitely be in favor of the Novorussians. Hmm. Well, okay, maybe we'll close with one last question. What if um, things just go the way they've been going? In this world, a lot of things just go the way they go. What if we just have another nine months of the last nine months, you know, off and on fighting uh, will there just be Minsk three, four, five, and you know? Yeah, that's a possibility too. Um, you know, that can't be ruled out. I mean, it's um, more of the same is probably the default position. In fact, right? I mean, that would be the thing that we think just as likely to happen is what we've seen happen. And that that's safe. That's a safe bet to make. Uh, I don't think it'll go that way. Um, although, if you're saying nine months, I can see that. You know, two years, it would tend to go, in my view, that it would just be more and more that the the regions, uh, Lugansk and Donetsk, um, probably, if the conflict were to be frozen for a long time, it'd probably include uh, some, some, something more in Kharkov going in the direction of Novorossiya. Um, maybe not Mariupol, um, but uh, Kharkov I can see before Mariupol, actually. Um, and I can see it freezing there, and then it, you know, uh, if they then can affect some kind of uh, a freezing of the conflict, then in a year or two, or something like that, then Russia announces that they recognize uh, the way they have w in Georgia, uh, mm. that they finally now recognize the the breakaway republics. Well, maybe um, the Russians can find a way to get Merkel to become the head of the UN, and uh, <laughs> then You're right. Then their position with Germany will improve. Yes, right. Yeah, exactly. So, in other words, there is that element that time may be on Russia's side in that sense. If if the U.S. can't create a true army out of the Ukrainian army, then time right. is probably on the Russian side. But if the U.S. can, then I would say it's a different ball game. But yeah. anyway, thank you yeah. so much for coming. Oh, thanks for having me. I'm glad we were able to dig into this as we always do, and it's it's been great. Okay, take care, folks. It's a wrap.